Okay, our next speaker is David Parrott. Mr. Parrott is currently in private practice, but he retired from the as the director and the examiner for the Oklahoma County District Attorney's State Laboratory in Oklahoma. He is a member of the question document section of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, a member of the Midwestern Association of Forensic, Doc, uh, Forensic Scientists, question document section, the Southwestern Association of Forensic Document Examiners, and he currently serves on the ASCLAD Lab Proficiency Review Committee, um, and David Parrott. First of all, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to address you and those of you back there on the, the cameras who I can't see. Um, first, although I'm the one addressing you today, I would uh, like the opportunity to introduce my co-author to this study. This is Gary Zabo. He's with an ASCLAD lab, accredited lab in Tulsa. I, uh, since he's making his appearance here today, I forgot to dr tell him to dress appropriately, but <laughs> if you'll forgive that, and he is here with us in spirit today, okay? I'm sure some of you can feel him. Um, first of all, let me give you a, uh, a little bit of background on how we became interested in the aspects of handling extended writing. In 1995, the uh, television or the televised trial of O.J. Simpson brought forensics into homes nationwide. The defense's attacks on the forensic evidence in that proceeding heralded a stepped-up assault on the forensic fields and also in other arenas. Also in recent years, the proliferation of forensic science programs uh, have brought the field even more attention. You know, many of these programs uh, feature some of the more visually appealing uh, forensic areas such as blood spatter interpretation, physical analysis of evidence. We felt, Gary and I in discussing this, that in part ignorance of the field of question document examination by attorneys, prosecutors, jurists uh, allowed initially the expert critics to make unsubstantiated claims uh, that at times were accepted by the courts. On uh, June 11, 1999, U.S. District Judge Nancy Gertner issued a written opinion, a memorandum in order in the case of U.S. versus Joanna Hines, citing information proffered by Mark Denbo. In that ruling, the judge drew an analogy between handwriting identification and with reference to allowing testimony from a federal document examiner. And here's a quote from the judge in which she says, indeed, indeed, Denbo draws an interesting analogy to eyewitness identification. Courts have concluded as a matter of law that one-on-one -on -one show ups are unduly suggestive. Likewise, Denbo suggests are one-on-one -on -one handwriting comparisons. The outcome of this analysis, for example, may be different if Harrison were given a lineup of similar handwriting exemplars to review and asked to determine which of this group is most similar to the robbery note author. Whether one adopts that specific approach or not, one thing is clear. When Harrison says, I conclude that Hines wrote the robbery note, she may well be going beyond her expertise. You can't disagree with a federal judge, but we did, in private, and now in public, so. <laughs> We're published, so it was already public. It was that judicial reasoning that sparked our interest in testing Denbo's ideas and the judge's comments that, you know, really suggested that one-on-one -on -one document examinations are suggestive. At the time of our initial study, there had been papers uh, published on handwriting characteristics uh, such as by Jan Seaman Kelly, Rick Horton. Uh, Farrell Shiver published this, the case report, the value of field assistance to the investigator in a counterfeit check case, which was particularly interesting to us because uh, 
This was in 1996. He conducted an examination while serving with the U.S. Army in which he reviewed handwriting from 1,000 soldiers in a uh, counterfeit check investigation. He, as I understand it, identified a suspect for investigators. The suspect ultimately confessed, and that, of course, validated Shiver's opinion. Our initial study was a, a small one. It's a very simple compared to some of the other ones that you've heard about and you're going to hear about. Uh, it sought to address the the ability of document examiners to identify the writer of a question document when compared to known standards executed by multiple authors. So we sat down and we thought, okay, um, most of you know from either watching TV or having been in law enforcement, typical police photographic lineup consists of what, six to uh, eight, possibly ten suspects. To replicate this scenario for handwriting identification initially would have entailed us giving a question document to a, some document examiners and giving them six to eight known writings from, or six to eight subjects known writings. But we thought, okay, let's raise the bar a little bit. Uh, so, The question document and accompanying standards chosen was the traditional London letter. Standards over the next about approximately year and a half were obtained from in excess of 1,000 writers, uh, male, female, left-handed, right-handed, minimum of 15 years of age. They ranged all the way up to 75 plus years old. We hounded churches, businesses, colleges, anyone who would give us known handwriting, standards that did not comply with the instructions for the execution of the, the handwriting were culled from that. For the initial study that we did, four sets consisting of two London letters were obtained from persons who had not participated in the thousand writer uh, gathering of the knowns. For those four sets, one was labeled questioned and the other one was given an assigned number. Those were then inserted in the 1,000 knowns with four being taken out, so we still had four, so we still had 1,000 known samples. This is a copy of the blank London letter that was distributed to all of the uh, known writers. And these were the uh, instructions that they were given. Some people couldn't read, forgot between the top of the paragraph or whatever, and printed, did things like that. So we had to take those out. This is one of the completed London letters with a uh, known number already assigned to it. This is what it looked like after we took the instructions. We took the instructions off of the top. This was the uh, answer key. Um, initially, we made uh, we made up a set of question to known that total 56. And this is represent, uh, representation of what the key looked like, but I've changed the numbers. So before I discuss how the initial set of four people that did this uh, performed on the exercise, let me briefly show you how the text test packages were formulated uh, for other examiners that wanted to participate in this exercise after the limited study was published in the Journal of the American Society of Question Document Examiners. We all work with copies, I think. Most of us do. 
to get originals nowadays is a somewhat of a luxury. Uh, I guess you could say that was one of the limitations of this study. Uh, we worked with copies. We made copies. We made a thousand copies for each examiner that wanted to take part in this study. Uh, participants were given a questioned London letter. They were provided with a thousand known standards. They got an answer form. The examiner, we split this up. I had a, a, a technician in our lab uh, do one part of this, and I did the other part so that if the examiner wanted to remain anonymous uh, in the follow-up, they could remain anonymous. Uh, and then they were given an examination affidavit. If they wanted their test results, they received a letter attesting to how they did. Uh, if they wanted to remain anonymous, the results were then just added to the statistics because we were interested in, in the results and how examiners did, not who they were. So this was the question. Could examiners associate a question document with not just one suspected writer or a lineup of six to eight, as was suggested in federal court, but could they take one question document and looking at a thousand writers, make an association or say that writer is not there? One of, one of the things that we also invited examiners to do uh, that helped us out and participated was to keep a copy or keep their copy of the uh, 1,000 riders. Uh, that provided a, uh, we told them, you know, you could use that if you want to as a database for handwriting characteristics. In fact, I used the 1,000 riders as a database on a homicide case in which I had a couple of handwriting characteristics that were somewhat unusual. And, in, uh, and indeed, in cross-examination, the, uh, the uh, defense attorney, uh, we got on that kind of line of questioning. And I told him that I had compared, you know, for instance, these two pointing to my display with uh, the handwriting of a thousand individuals and those two characteristics had not appeared in any or even one of those characteristics had not appeared in the handwriting of a thousand different individuals. This is the answer sheet. The affidavit, uh, they were given two choices. Uh, you had to identify or eliminate. And then they could check that they did not want to be identified or they wanted the uh, results of their examination sent to them. This is the examination affidavit. Now realizing that I, we did not have the opportunity to gather a room full of document examiners like you and do it all at once so that I could stand up here and make sure that no one looked on anyone else's answer sheet. And it wouldn't have worked anyway because they had, we had different question documents for every examiner that took part. So the results of the initial study, uh, the co-author Gary Zabel and I were two of the guinea pigs and uh, we had another retired law enforcement examiner who was in private practice, and we had another examiner who worked for a major metropolitan uh, police department in an accredited lab. And all of us reached conclusions, and we were all for correcting those conclusions. I think. Two common mistakes by laypersons analyzing handwriting are, you know, they focus on a limited number of char handwriting characteristics or they mistake class characteristics for individual or meaningful characteristics in handwriting. 
the methodology employed by qualified document examiners considers, of course, agreement or disagreement of class and individual characteristics. Individual document examiners and uh, laboratories, as far as how is, might this be applicable, uh, nowadays we're facing more and more instances of possible multiple rider cases. Uh, you have uh, incidences or incidents at schools, kidnap notes, robbery notes, a group of individuals or an individual targeting a, an ideological group, ethic, an ethical group or an ethnic group or a religious group. The other thing that we found was that this was kind of unintended, but some of the examiners that took part in this uh, we sent, like I said, we sent them a, a letter saying, okay, you got it right. You may, uh, you know, this association of document 108 with AA is a correct finding. Uh, some examiners began using that and as a, uh, of course, not an ultimate, but as a, a measure of a proficiency, as kind of a proficiency test, as it were. This is my contact information, and in my opinion, most of us know what we can and can't do, but we have critics. We do this day in and day out, and sometimes we don't actually stop and look at the way we do things and see if they can be improved, and we have started doing that now, and this, this group is evidence of that, and the people that aren't sitting here that are watching, taking the time to watch this, are evidence of that. And I think that, that, that critics have actually performed a useful function. You know, they forced us out of the era of it is because I say it is. And we've been prodded into doing these studies, limited studies, extensive studies, uh, to crunch numbers. And really, I think it's given us greater confidence in our profession, and we'll continue to do that and in ourselves, and given us greater confidence in the conclusions that we do make. Because thus far, as far as I've seen, the, the scientific measurement that we have done and that we're going to continue to do vastly supports us and not them. That's it. Thank you.